Well, I promised I'd review Gravity Falls when the show was over, and it ended about two months ago now, so I guess I'd better get on that. I love this show, but to explain why, I'm gonna need to give you some broader context. It is a good time to be a fan of animation. Whether anime is getting better every year or just finding new ways to stagnate is largely down to subjective opinion, but in the West, there can be no denying that animation is the best it's ever been. From Hollywood, we are seeing more consistently excellent animated family blockbusters than ever before. Of course, DreamWorks and Pixar are leading the pack in that regard, but Sony Pictures has at least one great movie for every dud, Blue Sky has finally figured out how to make a legitimately good film, and on top of their recent return to theatrical work with the Lego Movie, Warner Brothers Animation has spent the last few years creating straight-to-video Justice League movies that put most live-action superhero flicks to shame. I mean, we're getting a killing joke movie this year with Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. And I'm totally at peace with how fucking terrible Suicide Squad will probably be because Batman Assault on Arkham is awesome. Then you've got Hollywood outsiders such as Laika and Ardman producing beautiful stop-motion films with quirky, eccentric plot lines and dark humor. On top of all that, serious directing talent is now using animation to tell stories that just aren't possible in live action. Charlie Kaufman's Anomalisa is the best film of the last year period, and the worst Oscar snub in a decade. Saying why would be a massive spoiler, but trust me, if you haven't seen it yet, you need to. But as exciting as all that is, animation has made its biggest leaps forward on television. Through the introduction of serious, interconnected storylines, long-running franchises have recently seen their most impressive incarnations to date in shows like Young Justice, Clone Wars, and Mystery Incorporated. Then, of course, there's that... other one. Did someone say Friendship is Magic? <sighs> no. You are gonna, though. Yes. Okay, you Nova Brony, I was... Gonna talk about it in passing, but this video is about Gravity Falls. Are you- Ooh, I love Gravity Falls! Wallace is one of the most adorable pets you could ever have, and the depiction of unicorns is pretty much the best outside- Don't say it! Are you going to mention how you were wrong about the hand symbol and glasses on the Bill Cipher wheel? Because you were wrong about that. Yeah, probably more tactfully, but I was planning on it. Don't you have pony stuff to analyze? On your channel, I mean. Link in the doobly-doo. Oh yeah, I better get back to that. Thanks for the reminder. And also for the innocuous and not at all transparent plug. Real smooth how you integrated that. <laughs> That's what you pay me for, give me money. What excites me about this cartoon boom isn't the reinvigoration of big franchises, though. It's the new wave of high-quality, original, story-driven shows for all ages. Something that has been sorely missing for a long time. There are quite a few good shows in this vein out there now, but four are routinely trumpeted as the best of the best. Avatar The Last Airbender, Adventure Time, Steven Universe, and Gravity Falls. And of these, Gravity Falls was the second to get something that far too few shows ever receive, a proper ending. Now that it's over, we have an opportunity to look back over the series in its entirety and ask, was it really that good? Yes, yes it was. In fact, it's my favorite out of those four. So the more pertinent question is, why was it that good? And what makes it stand out from its contemporaries? There's a pretty obvious common thread linking two of the other big animated series. One that goes a long way to explain their success. Anime. The creators of Avatar and Steven Universe cribbed a lot from Japanese animation, and not just obvious visual cues. In terms of their themes, plot structure, character development, and overall direction, these shows are influenced at least as much by anime as they are by Western cartoons. And the same can be said for My Little Pony and Young Justice, and of course Teen Titans before that. Adventure Time is an animator's passion project through and through, and as such its primary source of inspiration is other cartoons, which just happens to include anime. It's as much inspired by American cartoons, European animation, and even video games. Gravity Falls draws from many of these sources as well. It wears a love for video games and anime and crappy 80s cartoons on its sleeve, but what distinguishes it is how much it draws from outside that sphere of influence. 
Alex Hirsch clearly has a broad love of American pop culture, live action and animated alike. Gravity Falls spends as much time reveling in old, campy movies, boy bands, and terrible British period dramas as it does in video games and cartoons. One of its best episodes is an homage to the work of Ray Harryhausen. And you won't find the roots of its plot in anime or video games either. What wasn't inspired by the production crew's own childhoods was mostly drawn from classic supernatural shows like Twin Peaks, The X-Files, and The Twilight Zone. This distinction is clearest in the show's contemporary setting. Avatar and Adventure Time both take place in high fantasy worlds, and Steven Universe spends as much time jetting off to fantastic locales as he does bumming around in Beach City, which is only nominally contemporary to begin with. By contrast, Gravity Falls is set in modern-day Oregon, specifically in and around a chintzy supernatural-themed tourist trap called the Mystery Shack. The roadside attraction is, in a way, the most American setting there is. Things like UFO museums and world's largest thing exhibits could only ever exist in a nation built around the automobile and obsessed with spectacle. So there's something immediately gripping about the idea of two kids sent to live in their great uncle's roadside scam museum for the summer. It encapsulates a lot of different kinds of summer nostalgia. The family road trip, the vacation with your weird relatives, being sent away to camp. There's something here for any North American adult to relate to and for any kid to fantasize about. And Gravity Falls gives those fantasies a chance to be fully realized. At the start of the show, young Dipper Pines finds an old journal hidden in the woods which contains exhaustive research about paranormal activity in and around the town of Gravity Falls. Dipper and his twin sister Mabel use this knowledge to fend off all kinds of supernatural threats, but at every turn a big question hangs over their heads. Who wrote the journal, and where are the others? These questions are usually pushed into the background to focus on the series' episodic plots, which usually see the kids coping with some humorously unconventional twist on a classic movie monster archetype. Over the course of the series, the twins deal with ghosts, zombies, uh, sorry, gnomes, game characters come to life, sea monsters, mermen, g-men, zombies, actual zombies this time, secret societies, time travelers, shapeshifters, and even lesser gods. The the only hard rule for what can show up in the series seems to be that it has to be weird, and it can't just be played straight. The thing that really sets Gravity Falls apart from other supernatural kid shows is that the weirdness tends to invade the contemporary setting rather than drawing the characters away from it. There are only a few episodes that take the kids from the familiar setting of the town to something more fantastical, and even then, these trips are usually brief or undercut with a B-plot focused on the town. Most serious kid shows tend to shy away from the real world because the presence of authority figures can limit storytelling potential and there's a danger of flying over kids' heads when you try to build a story around complex real world issues, but Gravity Falls fully embraces it and is better for it. It works around the parent problem by giving the Pines twins an unreliable guardian in their great uncle Stanford, and it trusts its viewers to get it when it lampoons contentious issues like politics and even class struggle. It's able to place that faith in its viewership for two reasons. Firstly, it respects the intelligence of the kids watching it, as well as man-children like myself, which comes through in the mature themes and the complex plotting, not to mention the crazy puzzles and codes embedded in each episode. Secondly, it has another huge draw on the off chance that viewers miss a beat. Its characters are all immensely memorable and endearing. The Pines twins, Dipper and Mabel, are incredibly strong protagonists. They each have their own strengths as well as strong moral convictions that make them good role models for kids, but at the same time they struggle with serious personal failings, and they rely on each other to cover up for their weaknesses. They make a good team because they're at the same place in their lives, but they have fundamentally different attitudes as to what should come next. Dipper wants desperately to mature quickly, a little too quickly, and be seen as a grown-up, whereas Mabel would be happy to never grow up at all. 
This character dynamic is almost purpose-built to drive good stories. The twins' clashing viewpoints create an easy source of conflict to propel a plot forward, but at the heart of it all, they love each other deeply, which helps to bring those conflicts around to believable happy endings. Their personalities are also a great source of comedy. Mabel's manic energy, total disregard for normalcy, and unhinged approach to pursuing her crushes is hysterical from minute one, and as you get to know Dipper, his bouts of neuroses and fumbled attempts at maturity, coupled with his insatiable, often self-destructive curiosity, shift from being a little annoying to hilarious in their own right. Dipper is played by Jason Ritter, who does an excellent job capturing his youthful determination and his awkward prepubescent squeaks. Are you saying my voice cracks? My voice doesn't crack. Mabel, meanwhile, is played by the inimitable Kristen Schaal, who is straight up one of the funniest comedic actors working today. From Last Man on Earth to Bob's Burgers, she's a distinctive standout in every role she takes on, and she's a perfect fit for Mabel's quirky persona. I successfully bezazzled my face! Blink! Ow! A few episodes of Gravity Falls are driven by having the twins bounce off each other, but the series really comes alive when the huge and vibrant supporting cast gets involved. The three most prominent supporting characters are, of course, the staff of the Mystery Shack. Grunkle Stan works well as a plot device. His lax attitude toward parenting allows the kids to run off and get into trouble without raising too many questions. But he's also one hell of a fun character in his own right. A con man with a heart of passable gold substitute, the schemes he concocts and the situations he finds himself in present boundless opportunities for often adult comedy. I can swear for real! Son of a... Stan's not a bad guy, but he's not exactly a good guy either. He has this roguish charm about him that lets him get away with just about anything, and he takes full advantage of it. And it's as fun to watch his schemes succeed as it is to watch them blow up in his face. Plus, his gruff demeanor makes him a good foil for the twins, who, left alone, might make the show feel too sappy or zany. Speaking of zany, Seuss is a comedic goldmine. The Mystery Shack's resident handyman is an emotionally stunted man-child with a paradoxically naive personality and cynical worldview. He looks up to Stan as something between a hero and the father he never had, and he believes in him unquestioningly. But at the same time, he has a knack for pointing out how messed up a situation is in the most hilariously blunt way possible. <laughs> Good luck sleeping tonight! Seuss also serves as an avenue for the show's creators to fully indulge in their own nerdiness. He has a boundless love for and knowledge of video games, anime, and other nerdy ephemera that Dipper's not really old enough to be into yet. And this is used to set up funny gags, like when he gets stuck in an arcade machine trying to get inside the game, and even A-plots for entire episodes. It probably won't surprise any of you that one of my favorite episodes of the entire series is Seuss and the Real Girl, wherein Seuss is stalked by an insane waifu from a cursed dating sim. It's a pitch-perfect skewering of an obscure subject that only works because Seuss is as knowledgeable and uniquely off-kilter as he is. Of course, Paul Robertson's beautiful sprite animations are also vital in selling the episode, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself on that. Both Stan and Seuss are portrayed by Alex Hirsch, the show's creator, and he does a pretty darn great job portraying them. Neither voice is particularly difficult to do, but they fit the characters really well, and ultimately that's what matters. Lastly, there's Wendy Corduroy, played by Linda Cardellini, the teenage part-timer hired by Stan to man the cash register in the Mystery Shack gift shop. Wendy's a prototypical slacker, doing everything she can to get out of work and even playing pranks on her boss. She's also the Shack's resident ass-kicker, as the only girl born into a family of rough-and-tumble lumberjack boys, she's more than a bit of a tomboy herself and ends up being the one the twins turn to whenever something weird or scary needs to get beat down. She also has a rebellious streak that comes out in force when her teenage friends get involved, which leads into some pretty crazy, awesome shenanigans. Basically, Wendy is cool. She's the epitome of cool. She's like the fawns in the body of a hot redhead, so of course, Dipper has a huge and totally unrequited crush on her. And she's even cool about that once the cat's out of the bag. Which is not to say that Wendy is perfect, even if Dipper does kind of put her on a pedestal. The dumb stuff she does with her friends can frequently get out of hand, and she's not great at solving problems through any means 
violence, but good old-fashioned violence. But her attitude and sardonic sense of humor does help to balance out the cast. She doesn't really carry any episodes on her own, but she improves quite a few just by showing up and looking cool. The Mystery Shack crew are the main characters of the show, but it has a huge cast of memorable side characters as well, from bumbling cops to hapless reporters to quirky old waitresses to handsome mermen Lotharios. It's shocking just how many of these characters manage to stick in your mind, even after just one or two appearances. This show is a testament to the power of good character design. In this, the show has a very Simpsons-like quality to it. In much the same way as most people can pick out their own favorite citizens of Springfield, I'm partial to Hans Molman myself, I'm sure most fans can pick out a favorite resident of Gravity Falls. Personally, I can't get enough of Justin Roiland as Blendon Blandon. You shut your time mouth! Having this huge and varied cast makes the town as a whole feel considerably more believable than it otherwise would. You get a sense that all of these characters have lives beyond the screen, which is, for me, the most vital element in maintaining my suspension of disbelief. Then, of course, there are the villains. Many of the antagonists that show up throughout the series are one-off supernatural threats, but Gravity Falls also has four recurring antagonists, all of whom are pretty interesting. The first to resolve her character arc is Pacifica Northwest, a snooty rich bitch played by Jackie Buscarino doing her best valley girl voice, who seems to look down on Mabel for acting silly and who struts around town like she owns the place, which, as a point of fact, she kind of does. In the early episodes of the series, she shows up frequently to mock Mabel and her friends and create problems for them, along with Dipper by association. However, as the summer goes on and we learn more about her, she becomes increasingly sympathetic. It seems like she kind of wants to be silly and fun like Mabel, but can't because of her strict, repressive parents, which explains her animosity. Pacifica eventually gets a really sweet redemption arc played across two episodes. First, she buries the hatchet with Mabel in the uproariously funny Gulf War, which makes a joke out of a man breathing his last heroic breath down in a mine, but the less trusting Dipper still struggles to forgive her. And as an audience member, I kind of did too. She's still pretty snotty and insufferable by the end of that episode. In the more plot-driven Northwest Mansion mystery, Dipper and Pacifica team up to take down a lumberjack ghost haunting her family mansion, and Dipper sees her good side at last. Pacifica and up rejecting her creepily controlling parents and finally lets her hair down, so to speak. And it totally turns her character around, at least for me. It's probably my favorite episode of the whole series. It's not difficult to make your audience hate a character, but turning it around and making them likable afterward is quite a feat. Doing that while also delivering satisfying character drama, a smart plot, and good comedy is next to impossible, but Northwest Mansion Mystery pulls it off splendidly. It's one of the strongest single episodes of television I've seen in ages. The show's creators didn't quite manage to pull off the same trick with Robbie Valentino, though. The sullen teenager, played by Silicon Valley's TJ Miller, who was born to voice disaffected douchebags, serves as Dipper's romantic rival and briefly as Wendy's boyfriend. Robbie certainly makes it easy to hate him. He's a total jerk most of the time, he has a tendency to lash out violently, and he's a bully toward Dipper. But unlike the rest of the villains, his actions are a little inexplicable. He's clearly insecure about himself and his relationship with Wendy, but I don't think I've ever met someone insecure enough to challenge a 12-year-old boy literally half their size to a fight over their girlfriend. Maybe it's just because I could never really take Dipper's crush on Wendy seriously as a plot point. A 12-year-old kid chasing after a 15-year-old was never gonna end well, and the way the art style emphasizes the difference in their ages really hammers that home. But Robbie just comes across as being a jerk for no reason, and it doesn't help that when he gets in a fight with Wendy, the totally unnecessary solution he comes up with makes him seem like a manipulative monster. The show tries to redeem him by having him move on and find someone new, but it doesn't even come as a result of his own agency. Robbie kind of falls into the background in his own stories, too. You'll probably remember his episodes more for memorable secondary characters like Rumble McSkirmish and Several Times instead of anything he does personally. As a main character, he's kind of weak. Fortunately, the rest of the main villains are a lot more interesting. The third villain we're introduced to is Gideon Gleeful, played by a delightfully unhinged Thorop Von Orman, the creator of the marvelous misadventures of Flapjack. There's an interesting trend in Gravity Falls where some of the most memorable characters are played by showrunners. Out of all of them, Justin Roiland included, surprisingly, I think Von Orman does the best job. Hand over the deed to the Mystery Shack right now, or Greyheart will befall him! 
This is Gideon, by the way. His Gideon is a perfect blend of precocious child, televangelist preacher, and southern fried con man. He manages to make the character feel funny while exuding a distinctive sense of creeping menace. And you really need that for Gideon, a selfish, spoiled brat who uses a journal of his own to run a psychic scam in Gravity Falls. Gideon wants three things in life power, money, and Mabel, and he'll use anything at his disposal to get a hold of them. In his first appearance, he tries to bribe and pressure Mabel into being his girlfriend, and he only gets more desperate from there on out. He's a total creep, but he's a charming creep. Gideon has an overpowering, chubby-faced cuteness that he uses to weasel his way out of trouble, as well as a scary level of charisma that makes it easy for him to convince others to follow his lead. He's like a cross between Pat Robertson and your bratty cousin who always gets his way. Gideon is a great antagonist because he embodies and amplifies all of the flaws of the Pines family. Like Mabel, he's in love with the idea of being in love, but he also has no sense of self-awareness or boundaries. Like Dipper, he's dangerously obsessed with the secrets of Gravity Falls, but for him, it's motivated by personal gain. Like Stan, he's a con artist, but he'd sell his own family to make a buck. With his scheming, Gideon can pose a credible threat to the Pines, and his manipulative nature explains how he can keep coming back. But he also challenges their growth as characters. In order to beat him, they have to be better than him. Gideon is a send-up of the very worst kind of con artist, not a playful trickster who takes advantage of the gullible like Stan, but a parasite who preys on people's hopes and good nature. He's also a phenomenal source of often dark comedy. His wars of one-upsmanship with Stan are frequently hilarious, and while it's sad, there's something twistedly funny about the way that his parents cower in fear of him. Gravity Falls does a lot that makes me think, holy crap, did they just do that in a kid's show? And Gideon fuels a lot of it, especially once he goes to prison. Not nearly as much, though, as the main antagonist, whose identity is kind of a spoiler, so I'm gonna stick one of those warnings you people keep asking me for right here. From here on, we're diving full bore into the show's central mystery and finale. If you still don't know if you should watch the show, it's hilarious, well-plotted, well-animated, and all-around great. So yeah, you absolutely should. I give it a gold medal rating. 9 out of 10 basement dwellers recommend! Now, if everyone who's worried about spoilers is out of here, let's get on with this. Bill Cipher, also played by Alex Hirsch, is basically an eldritch horror from outside the bounds of our reality, specifically the second dimension. He's an unknowable being of chaos and cosmic evil, literally born from madness itself. How freaking cool is that? In most kids shows, the most intimidating foe we're likely to see is some sort of monster or megalomaniac, but Cypher is far scarier than that, at least in concept. He's a cosmic horror who sees our reality as a plaything subject to his whim. He's a real, actual demon. Of course, in execution, this is mostly played for laughs, but they are dark laughs. Bill introduces himself to people by telling them when and how they'll die. Whoa, don't have a heart attack, you're not 92 yet! He finds pain and suffering to be hilarious, as evidenced by how he treats Dipper's body when he possesses it in sock opera. And when he gets his full powers in the finale, Weird Mageddon, he does some things that will probably scar a few kids for life. Oh wow, that's a great offer! How about instead I shuffle the functions of every hole in your face? <laughs> <laughs> Bill is just the right mix of likable and terrifying that makes for a truly memorable villain. He can't be bargained with, I mean, he can, but it's always a bad idea. His motives can't even be fully understood, but I'll be damned if he isn't entertaining as he fills the world with madness. On top of being fun to write and act in, creating Bill's episodes must have been a blast for the animation team because the very concept behind him lets them go totally off the rails. Bill is a demon who lives in the realm of dreams, where anything you can think of is possible, and that makes for some truly out there animation concepts, and when he escapes to the real world, the possibilities get even crazier. Gravity Falls has pretty damn impressive production values throughout its run. The character animation is strong, albeit rarely up to par with what we see in the intro, the backgrounds look great, and the overall design of the show's world is both pretty unique and very well suited to the production demands of a TV series. There are shows that look better, such as Over the Garden Wall, but not by much. And the show has never been afraid to go in experimental directions with its animation either. As I mentioned earlier, sprite art god Paul Robertson was brought in to bring video game characters Rumble McSkirmish and Giffany to life for Fight Fighters and Seuss and the Real Girl, respectively. And some of the scenes they pull off with his sprite work are awe-inspiring. They 
even have an episode that blends stop-motion animation with the show's art style. But as good-looking as the show is, it steps things up several notches in the finale. I can only imagine how much fun the animators must have had, conceptualizing and executing things like Bill's gross, fleshy transition into the real world, or the pockets of madness that he summons into the town. But I'd be remiss to just jump straight into the finale, because there's a lot of build-up to it over the course of the series. Most of it's very well executed, some of it is more than a little weak, but it's all worth talking about. The show does an especially great job of creating mysteries with satisfying conclusions. Right at the beginning of the show, we see Stan enter into a secret room behind a vending machine in the Mystery Shack. We don't find out what's behind it until the very end of the season, but when when we finally do, it's absolutely worth the wait. In the shack's secret basement, there's some sort of old ruined machine, and the plans to rebuild it are hidden in three journals, one of which Stan was holding onto the whole time, and the others he obtained from Gideon and Dipper after their climactic battle in the season finale. After waiting over a year for the new season to pick up, more mysteries start coming to light one by one. As Stan rebuilds the mystery device, Dipper begins investigating the author of the journals in earnest, eventually discovering that the now insane old man McGucket used to be the author's assistant. Unfortunately, with his brain scrambled, McGucket, also played by Hirsch, doesn't remember much of use, and every other angle Dipper pursues ends up being a similar dead end. The whole first half of the season focuses on Dipper struggling through this, which makes us hunger for the answers just as much as he does. Along the way, the show delivers a number of its strongest episodes yet, culminating in not what he seems. If the preceding episode, Northwest Mansion Mystery, is my favorite out of the series, then Not What He Seems is the one I found the funniest. For the first time, the twins get a look at who their great uncle really is, and the truth isn't pretty. Stanford isn't even his real name. Stan's actions have always bordered on criminal, but in this episode he goes all out, resulting in a lot of adult humor and a lot of dramatic tension. The episode is also one of the most visually impressive in the series. At the beginning, Stan has finally activated the machine in the basement, and as it powers up, gravity itself begins becoming undone. With the whole town randomly floating into the air, it makes for some exciting and inventive action sequences. And the conclusion to it is brilliant and gripping. Dipper and Mabel reach the device right before Stan, who begs them not to turn it off. Dipper is convinced that he can't trust his uncle, but ultimately the decision falls to Mabel, who decides to believe in him despite all his lying. It's a beautiful, bittersweet moment, and it's rewarded in a powerful way as we see a mysterious figure step out of the portal created by the device. With a six-fingered hand like the one on the journal's cover, he pulls back his hood to reveal that he is the author, as well as Stan's twin brother, the real Stanford. The Stan Pines we've known all this time is actually named Stanley. Their parents were kind of jerks, and not just because of their naming choices. Ford was always the smarter of the twins, and their parents ended up favoring him pretty heavily as a result. Stan and Ford were as close as Dipper and Mabel when they were younger, but they slowly grew apart due to the gap in their parents' expectations. Their sibling rivalry, along with Bill's scheming, eventually led to Ford being stuck in the second dimension and Stan taking up his identity while searching for a way to bring him home. Throughout the rest of the season, we get to know Stanford, played by J. Jonah Jameson himself, J.K. Simmons, while the twins deal with new concerns about potentially drifting apart like their uncles did. These are both really interesting developments. Ford is a solid addition to the main cast, whose straight-faced demeanor and obsession with science brings out new aspects of Stan, Mabel, and especially Dipper. I can assure you if there's an owl in this bag, he's long dead. And while the twins have fought before, the possibility that in 10 years they might not even be friends anymore has never really crossed their minds. It's a scary eventuality that really messes with their heads, especially Mabel's, whose worries are compounded by the impending end of summer and the inevitability of having to grow up. And on top of all that, the rift through which Ford arrived back in our world hasn't fully stabilized yet. Currently, it's contained in a glass globe, but Bill will stop at nothing Thing to crack it open and enter our reality. The stakes are the highest they've ever been. Unfortunately, with only six episodes between Not What He Seems and the start of the series finale, none of these ideas are giving the breathing room they need to grow. Ford's character ends up being left by the wayside in favor of more wacky standalone stories. There's one episode he's not even in. These are good episodes, but only two of them feel nearly as essential as what we saw during the build-up to Not What He Seems. With most of the mysteries solved by episode 11, the pacing is almost right to use this time to ramp up to the climax. But they probably needed at least two more episodes to really make it work, at least if they wanted to keep in stories like Roadside Attraction. Once we get to the finale, though, it's plenty satisfying regardless. In the lead-up episode Dipper and Mabel vs. the Future, Ford and Dipper make an excursion into a crashed alien space 
spacecraft to find materials that will help to better contain the rift. After their adventure is done, Ford offers to let Dipper stay with him as his apprentice, an offer that he immediately accepts. Unfortunately, at the same time, Mabel is experiencing a bit of a personal crisis. Summer is rolling to a close, the twins' 13th birthday is coming up, and adulthood seemingly looms right around the corner. Her friends won't even be able to make it to their birthday party due to end-of-summer family stuff. So when she hears Dipper accept Ford's offer, essentially abandoning her, she starts to spiral. When Dipper gets back, they get into a fight and she storms off into the woods with his backpack, which happens to contain the rift. Here we get the payoff for all those plot threads that the show never had time to develop, and to its credit, the next moment still has a strong impact. Blendon Blandon appears before her, telling her that the rift can be used to stop time and make summer last forever. Of course, it's obviously Bill Cipher in disguise, but by the time Mabel realizes that, it's too late. He cracks open the rift, connecting his reality to ours, and then things get weird. Weird Mageddon is a brilliant tour de force of experimental animation and top-notch storytelling, for the most part. Bill and his cronies break through to the third dimension, becoming fully corporeal, and swiftly everything goes to hell. The residents of Gravity Falls are turned into metal and shaped into a twisted throne of human agony. The remaining survivors scavenge for scraps in the ruined town, trying their best to avoid harbingers of the odd apocalypse like giant goats, flying eyeballs, and Pat from the Super Best Friends. Not one person, not one person has gotten in my mouth. On top of the monsters, the town is blanketed in bubbles of pure insanity that transform everything they touch. A car chase involving these leads to some creative and horrifying changes in animation style and a very clever fourth wall break. This nightmare scenario gives us a chance to see how all of the characters we've come to know react when the chips are down. Wendy, of course, thrives in this environment, going full Mad Max with Toby determined as her hapless sidekick. Seuss does equally well, traveling the blighted landscape and helping strangers like the hero he he was always meant to be. Gideon, meanwhile, ends up leading a gang of escaped convicts working as enforcers under Bill. Gideon's time with this gang of hardened criminals was one of the funniest aspects of the second season, and it's paid off in a hilarious Mad Max parody that takes up the bulk of the finale's first part. The chase doesn't end with a big explosion, though, but rather with Dipper appealing to Gideon's better nature. Finally understanding that he can't force Mabel to love him, he agrees to help stop Bill in hopes of becoming a better, more lovable person. Person, mostly. He and his gang of convicts go off to confront Bill in his pyramid while Dipper, Wendy, and Seuss go to save Mabel. The conclusion to Gideon's arc feels slightly rushed, but it works overall. I mean, yeah, you could say his 11th hour redemption is a little schmaltzy, but it's played well, and it sends a good message to the kids. There's a little good in everyone. I'm sure that moral has been ingrained in a lot of kids' heads by now, along with the horrifying nightmare imagery that keeps popping up when you least expect it. Speaking of, Dipper, Wendy, and Seuss find Mabel trapped inside a giant bubble marked with a shooting star insignia. Inside it, they find Paradise, a sugar-coated 90s-tinged paradise called Mabel Land, where everything Mabel wishes for, the bubble instantly gives her. In his own sinister way, Bill has kept his deal with Mabel, letting her ride out a perfect summer forever with a far radder version of her brother. Of course, it's all an illusion, but she doesn't really care. Reality is full of hardship, and everything in Mabel Land is perfect all the time, so she's happy to stay in this world forever, and... Yeah, you've seen this before. From a writing perspective, Mabel Land is kind of very formulaic, probably the most out of any episode in the entire series. The team has to pull together to stop the big bad, but one of them has become disillusioned and needs to be reminded of what's worth fighting for. It's a boring plot synopsis, especially for a show that usually revels in original concepts, but the execution of these ideas really elevates the episode. The sheer insanity of a world run by Mabel is a delight to behold, particularly the courthouse scene that serves as the focal point of the episode. John Stewart has a hilarious cameo as a big-headed cat judge, and that's one of the tamer parts of the episode. Underneath all the dumb 90s radness and diabetes sweet imagery, there's something evil at work in Mabel Land. I mean, of course there is, it was created by Bill Cipher. When Dipper tries to reject the temptations of the dream world, things get scary fast. 
and when he finally convinces Mabel to return to reality with him, in an incredibly touching exchange where he reminds her of all the times they've been there for each other, the whole place turns into a nightmare. More kids shows need to delve into legitimately disturbing material like this, in my opinion. A lot of the time, family-friendly entertainment feels overly sanitized, but the stuff that doesn't, the stuff that really challenges kids, tends to stick with them. I think most of us have at least one show or movie that we remember vividly and fondly because it scared the crap out of us when we were younger, be it Gremlins or The Brave Little Toaster or take your pick of 90s Nickelodeon shows. I have a feeling that a lot of kids are going to grow up with similar memories of Gravity Falls. I think that's especially true of the series finale, the hour-long special Take Back the Falls. In it, we finally see what Stan's been up to while the apocalypse is going down all around him, and it's not exactly noble. He's become the de facto leader of a group of survivors hiding out in the Mystery Shack, including many of the creatures Dipper and Mabel have encountered throughout the series. When Stan's mettle is tested, he's shown to be a bit of a coward, actually. Even when the rest of the survivors band together to turn the Mystery Shack into a mecha, sadly one without beam sabers, I watch a lot of anime and, <laughs> trust me, you're gonna want some gun swords. Stan is reluctant to leave the safety of his home, especially for the sake of saving Ford, who Stan sees as ungrateful. The confrontation between the Shaktron and Bill's henchmaniacs is one heck of an action sequence. The animation is stellar for the most part, integrating CGI and traditional animation almost seamlessly. I mean, it's obviously CG from how smooth it is, but it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb like what you see in most anime. There are a few shots that seem a little cheap, but on the whole, it's quite fun to watch. The rock remix of the Gravity Falls theme song that plays in the background gives it a lot of extra oomph. There aren't a lot of fights in this show, but it's clear they know how to pull them off when they need to. Inside the Pyramid, the Mystery Shack crew rescues the captured town folk along with Stanford, who reveals Bill's weakness, which, as fans of the show guessed years ago, is the Zodiac that flashes at the end of the intro. If the ten characters represented by the symbols on the wheel hold hands in a circle, they can create an energy powerful enough to destroy Bill. That would be too easy a solution, though. At the 11th hour, neither Stan nor Ford can let go of their pride long enough to complete the ritual, and in the middle of their bickering, Bill captures most of the team and threatens to kill the twins in order to get what he wants from Ford, an equation that will overcome Gravity Falls' bubble of weirdness magnetism and take Weird Mageddon global. The kids manage to run away, buying some time, but Bill goes full eldritch horror and chases after them. The Elder Pines twins must think of a solution in the time they have. Bill needs to make a deal and shake someone's hand to enter their mind, and in the mindscape he becomes vulnerable. Knowing this, Ford and Stan hatch a scheme to trick him. When he comes back with the kids and threatens their lives, Bill finally gets what he wants, or so he thinks. He shakes hands with Ford and enters his mind, but inside he finds Stanley. Apparently, he can pull off a pretty mean J.K. Simmons impersonation, and with their clothes swapped, nobody can tell the difference, not even dream demons. While Bill is inside Stan's mind, Ford hits him with the memory erasing ray from the Society of the Blind Eye, erasing Bill from existence entirely. But Stan is also erased in the process, left a shadow of his former self while his family mourns his effective death. This is a solid reincorporation of plot elements taken from throughout the series, and sets up a painfully bittersweet conclusion for about five minutes, until a look through Mabel's scrapbook instantly undoes all the damage. I'm hesitant to call it a cop-out, since the scene where the whole family gathers round Stan to reminisce in the ruins of the Mystery Shack is very poignant in its own right, but it does kind of make Stan's sacrifice feel a little hollow. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to have Stan back, he's probably my favorite character in the entire cast, but when you have a selfish, prideful character complete their arc through self-sacrifice for their family and friends, it kind of under undermines it if there are no actual consequences. I mean, yeah, Stan still thought that he would disappear forever, and he still made that decision with noble intent, but from the audience's perspective, this kind of thing really lowers the stakes of a conflict. With that said, lowering the stakes can work to the benefit of a comedy, and the episode from here on out is pretty damn funny and heartwarming. And the show still has a strong, bittersweet ending. After a big, crazy birthday party, Dipper and Mabel have to say goodbye to their friends and head back home to California. Every principal character gets to say their piece, and we're left feeling satisfied but wistful. 
Weird Mageddon is overall a great conclusion to a great show. It ties up every major plot thread into a neat little bow, gives us closure on every important character arc, and delivers a ton of great gags, strong dramatic scenes, and spectacular animated set piece moments. But it's not quite perfect. The lead up to it, especially after the long and satisfying build up to the reveal in Not What He Seems, is rushed. And at the end of the day, it feels like the show is over too soon. And to an extent, that's what they were going for. Even the best summer vacation seems like it's over just as it begins, but it felt like there was a solid season's worth of ideas left unexplored. Alex Hirsch always wanted Gravity Falls to be a finite series with a definitive conclusion, and that's part of what makes it feel so refreshing next to shows like Adventure Time, but I think it could have benefited from being a bit more drawn out. Gravity Falls has a lot of great episodes that are effectively filler. Most of them have things going on in the background, or stinger moments at the end to advance the plot, but for the most part they're just focused on the crazy weird stuff in the foreground, and on the characters who may not have immediate bearing on what's transpiring. And that's Fine! These side plots are often hilarious, and these characters are extremely likable. In fact, I kind of wish they'd been given more time in the spotlight, because some of them are built up quite a bit and then never really given any closure. Pacifica's probably the best example of this. After Gulf War and Northwest Mansion Mystery, she has a ton of potential for character growth. She even seems like she'd be a surprisingly good fit to fill the romantic void left by Wendy when she finally rejects Dipper. They have great chemistry in the episode that they share and their hang-ups kind of balance each other out in a way that could facilitate further character growth. But she doesn't show up again until the ending of the series, and when she does, she's kind of reverted to who she was before, with her spoiled, entitled attitude being played up for laughs. Her parents even have to convince her to touch McGucket, even though her whole arc was about letting go of her pride and rejecting their elitist views, which they never corrected themselves. Her few throwaway lines are funny, but it's disappointing to see such a strong character be sidelined like that as soon as she becomes interesting. The same thing kind of happens to Stanford, since he's only got six episodes to develop before the finale and he's in the background for most of them. He mostly ends up serving as a catalyst for advancing other characters' arcs, but at least he gets enough screen time in the finale to remedy that a bit. You know who doesn't get enough screen time in Weird Mageddon? Bill's Henchmaniacs. They all have such wonderful, imaginative designs straight out of Ah! Real Monsters, but as characters, they're barely explored at all, although I have a feeling that some of their backstories might not make it past the Disney censors. I have butchered millions on countless moons. At this point, though, I'm nitpicking. Gravity Falls doesn't take time to fully explore all of its characters and concepts, and I think it could without undermining the story, even if it were just given eight more episodes to make two full-length seasons, but it gets it right where it counts. The mystery at the heart of the show is intriguing and has a satisfying conclusion. The principal characters are likable and fleshed out. The individual episode plots are imaginative and bold, and the writers manage to nail both light and dark humor. This is great television. Easily a gold medal show. I just wish there were more of it. And now, almost 8,000 words in, I'm finally done talking about Gravity Falls. Whew. I'm feeling a little lightheaded. For real, CJ, I actually am feeling a little lightheaded. If you're not sick of my voice yet, you might enjoy checking out my analysis of the show's intro, where I got almost everything right. Oh, dang, I almost forgot to mention the show's final mystery. At the end of Weird Mageddon, there are clues pointing to the location of a Bill Cipher statue hidden somewhere in the woods of Oregon, or maybe Piedmont, California, which is apparently part of some secret contest Alex Hirsch cooked up. I think stuff like that is just rad. Anyway, this video was edited by my boy CJ from What's With Games. You know, the guy I did my Splatoon review with. You've all watched that, right? CJ just put up a sick video talking about QuickTime events, which I highly recommend you all check out. And subscribe to his channel while you're at it. His stuff's really good. Also, maybe subscribe to mine if you're not already, and follow me on Twitter at G0FF2 for regular updates about what I'm making. Hiring CJ to make this episode was made possible by viewers like you, specifically through your support via Patreon. So thank you for that from the bottom of my cold, black, icy heart. This video literally wouldn't have happened without your help. My crazy production schedule just wouldn't allow it. And I'm really glad it did, because reviewing shows like this, while it's quite an undertaking, is a hell of a lot of fun. With that said, as always, reality is an illusion! The universe is a hologram! Buy gold! Bye!